We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. What do you think about the Laker team now? You follow the box scores of the games every day? Just the Lakers. You're kidding. That is really a compliment. I was pleased to see you smile at the top of our show because once the game starts, you have a game face. You don't smile much out there. I don't think you have to do things for money anymore. Correct. What's up, Laker fans? Welcome to the Laker Film Room Podcast. I'm Pete, joined by Darius. It's good to be back. Let a little bit of a Laker news build up over the last week or so. Uh, we had the schedule release. We are going to very much miss Mike for that, D, but I would love to get into that, maybe do a, a whole pod on that perhaps tomorrow, but we'll see. But we'll we'll get into that a little bit. The Lakers coaching staff about a week ago, maybe a little bit more came into shape. I have less to say on that than you might think, but I do want to uh, touch on a couple parts of that. And uh, the Lakers signed Kyler Kelly and Quincy Oliveri to Exhibit 10 contracts. What Exhibit 10 contracts are is they will be invited to training camp. They'll play in some preseason games, and then they will end up on South Bay. However, I do think that Kelly and Castleton are kind of in a competition for the big man two-way spot. We could talk about that in a little bit. D. And I have a Jared Vanderbilt video coming out today that I think we'll talk about a little bit more tomorrow. So, D, you've had yourself a busy weekend, man. How you doing? Where are you at on the Lakers right now? So, yeah, I've been busy indeed. A bunch of stuff happening for me in my personal life. In terms of the Lakers, it's the dead zone, man. Yeah. And it's interesting because the entire summer has been sort of this lull, right? And I think we all expected there to be something that would happen. And we kept finding reasons to think that there would be a delay for this or a delay for that. It's just like, will they make a trade on draft night? Okay, it's free agency. Are they going to do X, Y, and Z to open up roster spots? Are they in the hunt for this? Are they in the hunt for that? And we are all the way in the dead zone period now where I don't expect a lot of meaningful or even non-meaningful activity until we start to approach training camp. So I wanted to sort of kick this idea back to you really quickly, Pete, is you talked about news with the schedule and the coaching staff. And that stuff is normally stuff that we reflect on under the prospect of this is the team. So it's hard to talk about schedule if Schedule talk is about matchups and what are you going to do against this specific team? I know that that's the granular level. There's stuff that Mike would get into that I don't even have the bandwidth to absorb fully without diving in beyond even all of the work that he did for his piece at Lakers.com. But for me, it's like one of the things I like to think about with the schedule is matchup A versus matchup B and then start to dive into who's going to be playing against who. Uh huh. And... There's a pretext to that, that this is the roster. And you and I have been talking a little bit offline about, is this the roster? Kind of yeah. seems like it's going to be the roster. I felt I feel like I've the last couple of months been trying to say, this is going to be the roster for a little bit. And we've been looking for like Jeremy Grant and whatever these things are. And I've been trying to say like, no, I think this is what the team's going to be to start the year in that I don't think that this is the time to do it. And so in some ways, like this is 
the most continuity that we've had from one year to another, right? We talked about that a ton last year, but like half the roster was new last year. This year, the big difference is really uh, connect in, Bronny in, and then Dinwiddie and Prince out. But it's pretty much the same guys, at least to to start out. Yeah, and so the Lakers have a 15-man roster. You talked about the two signings to Exhibit 10 deals. They've got, I think, three guys. All of their two-way spots are filled. But I was under the impression, seemingly wrongfully so, that there would be some movement at least at the end of the roster to sort of clear up at least one roster spot. The Lakers typically do not go into a season with all 15 roster spots filled and all of their two-way spots filled. The two-way spots have normally been there, but they usually carry 14 guys. And so I was under the impression they'll at least do some sort of two-for-one deal at the end of their roster where they trade a minimum guy or two minimum guys for one or dump a minimum guy into someone's cap space by offloading some future second-round pick. And I suppose that that could still happen, but I wanted to kick this idea to you. If this is the 15-man roster and they are going to give all of these guys a chance to sort of come into camp, do you think that A part of this is new coach, new training staff. Let's give all of these guys a look and a chance to compete to see who actually fits with what we want to do. This is the summer of J.J. Redick to me. That's what's new, right? And I don't think the Lakers are coming back with the same roster by choice. I think they would have loved for a trade to have materialized that was like, yes, we should, yes, we should do that trade or have a vet men guy materialize that was suited our needs, but also wanted the type of role that we could provide, right? We've talked a little bit about this with Gary Trent Jr. and, you know, Spencer Dinwiddie signed elsewhere, right? Where it's like, hey, you can't guarantee him minutes over Gabe Vincent. You can't guarantee Gary Trent Jr. minutes over Max Christie. And so I I think there's a certain amount of like, this is what the team is right now. I think that I think there's a possibility that something materializes at the, materializes at the end of summer. Last offseason, right, a lot of the deals finally went down, right? Am I remembering this correctly? Toward the end of the summer, like the Drew trade, the Dame trade, I think, happened in yes. August, right? Or yes. maybe September. So I think that that is – it's all about deadlines, right? We're talking about negotiations in these – and we've got to think like really big picture long term over the course of – years and there there's the off season and then there's the trade deadline. Those are the two main times where trades happen or or get activated. And so in many respects the Lakers are that's what I've been trying to say is like I think they've evaluated similar to the summer of 2022 after the rust season where it was like they they obviously have to make a change, but they really didn't, right? They they waited to make the big change until later. And so that's why I think that there is – I don't think that it's an intentional like, oh, yay, let's bring the same group of guys back and let's just have them compete under Redick. I think that's sort of kind of how it's worked out. That said, there is a lot of ground to cover with, with this particular aspect of the team. One thing I want to do a pot on with you this week is about keeping the good from Darvin Ham, right, where yeah. we – It's so easy to be like, oh, yeah, that guy we just fired, he was terrible. He didn't do anything right. But that's not true. And there were actually several things that were good about last year's team that it – Basketball can be that sort of whack-a-mole where you try to address the thing that you're not that you weren't the year before, and then you create a hole elsewhere, and then you're trying to constantly chase that. And so to me, this summer is about the implementation of Reddick's philosophy, about creating the infrastructure for players to be able to work out, work on their game, watch film, and have that that building out player the player development actually happen because it's harder to do this during the season right the individual skill development the if you want to change your jumper are you going to do that after game 30 hell no if you want to make any like legit changes to how you shoot your footwork things like that you do it over this period of time and so establishing that on the individual level and then as soon as they can get into the five on fives the five on o stuff even the breakdown type of stuff for implementing what reddick wants like there's been a quote from ad that's been ringing around my head that they asked ad about the changes to the offense and he was like 
none of us have played in this style of offense before. And that really caught my ear. And he was preaching patience, saying, I don't expect us to get it even by the end of training camp. Uh, obviously, you know, championship is on our mind, but we're in no rush to uh, try to get this thing figured out uh, by the end of training camp. You know, um, he is a first time head coach and this is going to be a new system for all of us. Um, something new that I've been in my career and pretty sure everybody on the team. So um, it's going to be a, a challenging experience, but also it's going to be fun. Now, what can that mean? I don't know, but it indicated a certain amount of like, oh, we've talked and we've talked in detail. And this was at the Olympics, right? So this was a couple of weeks back in terms of the when they were going over it. And so to what degree are they in the weeds of that, I think is super important. Let's go to break here. And when we come back, I do want to talk a little bit about this idea of continuity and what can actually be gained in terms of continuity when you do replace the guy who dictates what <laughs> continuity actually looks like. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Despite the unshakable Iowa Corn Cyhawk rivalry, there is one thing Iowa State and University of Iowa fans can both agree on. Getting hyped for unleaded 88. It's cleaner burning and better for your engine, and it's cheaper than other fuel options, making Unleaded 88 the clear fuel choice. If Iowa Corn Cyhawk rivals can agree on it, you know it's worth the hype. So pump it up with Unleaded 88, grown by Iowa Corn Farmers. So that AD quote is an interesting one, Pete, because we talked about continuity last season. And that was supposed to be about lineup continuity, right? And then like personnel groupings and these guys are familiar with, with each other. And so what better way to propel that forward than to bring those core pieces back? And then the Vando injury was very unfortunate. And then we also don't talk enough about like the Rui injury stuff at the start of the oh, season right. where he just had a run of, oh, he's playing for a couple of games and then his nose is broken. And then, oh, wait, does he have a concussion? Yeah. And then he was snake bit early in the season, just like anything that could go wrong. Yeah. Then like his hamstring or his calf, he was in and out of the lineup a little bit at the beginning of the season two. Then all those choices were made and then D'Lo and Austin and we've beat that horse enough. We sort of sabotage our own continuity in that regard. Next season, you do have guys who have played together a fair amount, but like AD said, not in this style. And so we both played basketball at a very low level and you've coached basketball. How do you propel continuity forward from a personnel standpoint, but when the environment sort of changes, like those structural sure. things change, right? And so you've got the people, right. but now we've got a whole new system and everything. And like, what does that look like to you? I think that's a good way of putting it in that it makes it easier if you're familiar with your coworkers in a way that I don't think this is something that is actively done by the coach, but I think that this is a benefit that Reddick will have in that these guys have played together before. They've gone through some of their figuring out and growing pains, the, oh, this works, but this doesn't. They've got a a great menu of ball screens, which is really the main thing from like what to keep from 
uh, from Darbin's system is like they've got a great menu of five out ball screens that is just like I remember that quote where they Mike asked Taylor Jenkins what's so hard about guarding the Lakers he's like they run a zillion ball screens I'm par- paraphrasing but that's basically just from a guy who spends all of his day and it gets paid to scheme against other teams that's the thing that stood out to Taylor Jenkins about the Lakers is that just the way they run pick and rolls and from digging through the data I want to do a, a stat pod with you sometime soon but the Lakers had three guys that had really high volume as pick and roll ball handlers, Austin, D'Lo, and LeBron. I really want to get into Austin's numbers because there's some interesting stuff in there. Um, but just that that volume of that and the ability to have three different guys to do that at a high level with you know with those two and, and D'Lo is a great thing to have. So can we keep that? And there is something to build off of where it's not that first few weeks of like, oh, Torian Prince is new, Cam Reddish is playing 20 minutes, like Prince is gone. And it, really the main guy to incorporate is Connect. And he everything's new to him, right? It's not just the system and the team. It's being in the NBA at all. And so incorporating a rookie to me is a lot easier. And so that's one of the benefits that Reddick has is like these guys at least know like, hey, this guy knows where he, this guy likes to catch – the ball right here on his spot up threes. This guy is always going to sprint to deep corner. So I know I can throw it ahead. Just the certain things that come with playing with the same players over the course of multiple years. So I have a question for you on top of this, because this is something that intrigues me a great deal. The idea of transitioning from a Darwin five out system to a Reddick five out system in AD's quote. That stuff rings out in my head the same way that it rings out in yours. But this team went through a offensive shift from the season before as well, right? And so they ran a four mm-hmm. out system under Darwin with many of these same core players in terms of their core five or six guys, right? So Austin, D'Lo, LeBron, AD, Rui, and Vando were all on that team that went to the Western Conference Finals. They played a four out offensive style. There were injuries and whatnot, but then they went into the next season and they changed up their offensive style to a five out system. And now they're changing it again. Do you think that the shift from four out to the style of five out that they played, that they can use that muscle memory or that understanding of what it was like to play together under one system to then shift to a new system and now carry that forward at all? Do you think that that's helpful to them as well? Beyond just the familiarity of I've played with you now for a year and a half. I think it's helpful and it's harmful. Um, so a couple of things. The f- They played a lot more five out after the trade deadline, after they traded Russ, because they needed to have so much space and ability to get downhill. And that's harder to do in five out type of style. That And when we talk about this, it's not like 100% one and 100% another. This, these are mixed throughout the game and depends on what you're running. But after the trade deadline, they did run a lot more five out. I remember being feeling somewhat tortured that we decided to make Malik Beasley coming off of screens and handoffs like the centerpiece of our of our starting group, right? We have this great starting group, and it's like, hey, let's run the offense for Malik Beasley. And a lot of that was out of five out type of spacing. And so, but the thing that was different is that this was all on the fly, D. And this is kind of speaking to your point in that I think there's a resiliency that's built in figuring out a bunch of different styles. And I think that you can always kind of, you have a security blanket. That's how I see it more than it being beneficial to this style. And kind of where I see it being harmful, for example, is last season, remember I was I was perplexed at the beginning of the year, especially like, why are we constantly over penetrating? I was so excited about the five out switch. And then I'm like, oh, we're running a lot of pick and rolls. Okay. That's interesting. And then we're just driving right into the teeth of the defense. We're never popping out. We're never doing any of that stuff. And to me, that was a vestige of the four out style, right? Where that year before and how we started that year in training camp with Russ, with Lonnie, and that was the personnel on the team. We didn't have much shooting. And so it was like, we have to get downhill. We have to create environments where we can get downhill. And so I think that mentality crossed over into the beginning of last season where it's like, 
get downhill, get downhill. And that was still very much a part of Darwin's ethos, but also LeBron and AD's ethos of we're going to get to the basket, we're going to get downhill. But because the spacing was was different in a, uh, in a lot of situations, they were running into brick walls a lot of times or running into on-ball deflections and just the angles were different. Part of that was growing pains too, right? And so I think that AD is probably right when he says, hey, we're not going to have this by the end of training camp. And this particular style that I think they're going to go to is very read and react player decision making heavy. And like it's basically it's a little more complicated than the previous styles of basketball that they've played being a very pick and roll heavy five out team, also a very pick and roll heavy four out team under Darvin. This is a little more like you have to read the situation, read the defense and make the right choice off of that in ways that just has more layers to it than the ball screen stuff does. That's interesting because when you said security blanket, that like continued to ring out in my head a little bit. And one of the things that I've always thought about players is that they get to a certain point in their career and they don't change very much. Yep. We always expect players to be like malleable and adaptable and it's like, okay, we'll go do this. But you're in the league four or five years and you can get better, but the things that you're good at are typically the things that you're good at. And the way that you have found success, if you've made it to your second contract, those are the things that have been reinforced in you that you should continue to do because they've allowed you to stick in the league for as long as you have. And so... I remember watching, this was during the Olympics, and the LeBron AD pick and roll, it was in one of the like metal round games, and they looked so comfortable running that together as a duo, like in the second half of, of a game where it wasn't like crunch time, crunch time, but it was clearly like, let's get a basket right now, and LeBron and AD were on the court, and they went to a side pick and roll. and. That idea of having a security blanket, I think, is going to be super helpful for a coach like Reddick when he can always say, and Phil did this with Kobe and Shaq, like when it was crunch time, they didn't run center opposite. They weren't doing right. all of the like <laughs> fancy triangle, like, oh, let's let's run blind pig in order to get Kobe. No, it was we're going to clear a side and we're going to run pick and roll with Kobe and Shaq because that's devastating. And so I think the ability for Reddick to look big picture and say, this is what I want to implement from a five out style and read and react and more sort of nuanced understanding of where players should be from a teamwork standpoint, that can be your roadmap. But all of these little pathways off of that roadmap could still be like, oh, we're going to diverge and we're going to go off of this little side trip here and we're going to run and we're going to spam some LeBron and AD pick and roll or we're going to spam some step up screen and roll action with LeBron as a ball handler and Austin screening, right? Because those things work. Absolutely. And there are going to be some games where it's like there's four minutes and 30 seconds left. The game is tied. We got to win this game tonight. Like, yes, we want to work on all of our long term stuff and be ready for the playoffs and all of that. But guess what? That's what the playoffs turn into as well, which is as, as you yeah. just explained. Let's go to break here. And when we come back, I want to shift back up to a couple of the opening topics that we were discussing with like some Lakers new stuff. So, Pete, we never really pinged ideas about the Lakers coaching staff. And Reddick, at his introductory presser, really talked about this idea of experience, but also like worker bees, right? I think uh -huh. he wanted both. And he wanted from one side to have people who could really supplement his lack of head coaching experience uh -huh. with their own sort of like, I've been there, I've done that, I've seen it all, I've been around the block. Not only have I been around the block, I built the buildings and planted the trees on that <laughs> block, right? Like that yeah. sort of idea. But on the other side of the bench, he wanted like people who were going to be able to get on the court with players, help in their individual development, help with their team development, and really be active 
within the context of improving the younger players on the team. And it seems like he was able and the organization was able to strike that balance with the coaches that they hired. And and so what's your general feedback and start on the veteran side with Brooks and McMillan? Yeah, so I definitely think that Brooks and McMillan are the answer to the experience point. But when you present it overall as the combination of experience and the ability to get on the court and be a worker bee and kind of get your, you know, roll up your sleeves and get your your hands dirty. The what I hear there is there's an absence of one aspect and that's the X's and O's, the schematics. And so the way this coaching staff is constructed, I think that it leaves a lot on Reddick's plate from a X's and O's standpoint. And I now I don't know enough about Harding to make an assessment of her on on that aspect one way or the other. The one thing is though with the G League, for one, you're usually running a reflection of what the team uh what the parent team was running. And I do know that that's what the Stockton Kings ran. But there's also so much roster turnover that you can't get really complex in the G League because there's just different guys on a night to night basis, or at least frequently enough. Now, or maybe that's just the the Lakers, right? But from my experience, from my knowledge of the G League more broadly, is it's not a team that's constructed to be together for the whole year, right? It's a collection of individual players that are all trying to kind of find a job in the NBA somewhere, ideally with that parent club, but not always. And so it's just a different basketball environment that is not as conducive to complex like, okay, you set a screen there, you come around here. It's a lot of, it, a lot of times it's kind of the basic food groups of X's and O's and schematic stuff. So uh, we'll see, but I do wonder kind of who helps Reddick from that standpoint. And I do think that from hearing him talk, and I think you can speak on this better, D, is I think that Reddick really has a heart for that. And that's something that I think that he's excited about bringing to the table. And there is a, I'm a 49er fan and uh, Kyle Shanahan calls his own plays because even though he's the head coach, he was the OC and this is the world he comes from. And I see that in Reddick. I'm not positive of that, but I think that's what he's going to be. When we looked at McMillan and Brooks, and I think Brooks had this reputation as a head coach is that he was like a player's coach and like a leader of men sort sort of guy. And he was kind of like that as a role-playing point guard as well. But that his X's and O's acumen was not necessarily at the level where you felt like, oh, oh yeah, that's my guy, right? And I think Redick, that's his strength. I think if he's, if Redick was very open about like, I don't have a lot of experience, right? But he was also, you know that he's got a certain amount of um, critical self lens. And as a perfectionist, as he was as, as a player, he's probably someone who was ultra hard on himself in a lot of ways, but he would also tell you what he's good at. So as a player, he would be able to tell you yeah, like I may not be the best defensive player and these are my weaknesses here, but I'm going to shoot the shit out of the ball because I'm J.J. Redick, right? And as a head coach, I imagine him to have a very similar worldview of I understand my own strengths and that his strengths are going, going to be like, I can read the game. I understand the X's and O's of this. And what I hope he gets from his veteran coaching staff like the veteran side, the McMillan, the Brooks, is that as Reddick is talking out ideas or proposing ideas, that they're the ones that can come in and say, here's what my experience is in dealing with some of that in order to help refine the things that are going to work from JJ's perspective, rather than them being the people who are presenting ideas to him as like the lead, right? That they're there to supplement his own sort of I don't want to call it galaxy brain thinking, but if he's like, no. like, oh, in the weeds and like, oh, this is what I see and this here. And I think this can work and that can work that they're there, that they are then there to say, ah, yeah, I see that. And what about if we tweak that with this? It's like they're not necessarily being the leads in that way. Uh-huh. I expect Reddick to be the lead in that way. But for them to sort of help steer that ship a little bit, if he's going to captain it. They're also like salty dogs in a way that, and Reddick has a chippiness to him too, that is just very, 
very refreshing to me after last season and watching garbage time groups just not give a crap and get their butts kicked. There's just a a level yeah. of like set the freaking screen like that we were sorely lacking in in last year's uh, coaching staff, and so that has a dark side to it as well, right? And I think that that is something that is going to be a curious part of how we get through the season is that's something Nate McMillan has had history with players where he rubs them – he's a little too honest, right, and rubs them the wrong way. And so that experience, a lot of times, you know, there's a reason why – Older coaches, older players get played or coached out of the league, right? It's sure. no longer relevant what they bring to the table. So it's I don't want to say that it's all it's all, you know, sunshine and roses, but I do think that they did address the experience perspective. That said, with as much of a heart that I think Reddick has for this sort of stuff, I would love for him to have someone to bounce that off of that can joust with him on that level. So I don't know enough about the coaches to say they can or can't, but I hope they have someone that they can. Well, I'm just hoping that to me, it's like the collective wisdom of the room as well. Right. And one of the things that I expect from Reddick, I don't hope this, I expect it because this is sort of what from my perspective, he's bringing to the table is that he's going to set the tone in terms of this being a room of high level dialogue and of high level basketball thinking that he's going to set those terms of we are going to do this at this level. And I think he's going to expect that from the players as well. And so when you were talking about that salty dog idea and like the no nonsense, one of the things I I hope to see from Reddick as a head coach as well is like, no, we're going to do this right. Mm-hmm. Like this is the way here. One of the things during the the Olympics that I really enjoyed was all of the coaches sort of talking about LeBron in this way mm-hmm. of him bringing a certain ethic to practice. It's awesome. This is where my head is a- around this. And one of the coaches that talked about that was Spolstra, because Spolstra coached LeBron, right? But then I'd listen to D. Wade talk about Spolstra in that same exact way, right? Where it's just like, no, 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 no. This dude from the Pat Riley tree, (laughs) we're going to do this right. If we don't do it right, we're going to keep doing it until it is right. And then that's when we'll say that we're done. Did you hear Pat Bev talking about how Darwin apologized to him? In yes. Vegas. Did you hear about this? Yeah. If you didn't I hear about this, clip. if you're listening to the pod and you didn't hear about it, basically he apologized to Pat Bev because Pat Bev was advocating that the Lakers practice more. And it apparently is a regret of Darbin's that he wishes they practiced more. Now, if you've listened to this podcast, <laughs> for one, for one, that was very validating to hear. It's also central to this team. Now, think about this. And in the context of AD's quote, especially, where it's like, this is a little more complicated. None of y'all have really played in this style before. If you expect to win at any high level at all, you have to be able to practice. You have to be able to work on it and get through it. And if nothing else, the games have to be more of a like team-specific, opponent-specific, game-to-game type of game plan in order to prepare for the playoffs. But there has to be a level of like, no, we got to work on this on a day-to-day basis. And so to me, D, that's the other part of this is that we're going to think of, about this on a high level and no stone is going to be unturned. That's part of it. The other part is we're going to do it every single day. Yeah. And I get that there's going to be challenges that come with that because of LeBron's age and everything else. Right. And so that said, I do hope that this team does practice more, even if it's not full on like we're out there running, of do, course, but I want them course. on the court going through things. It can't just be a film session and then that's it, right? There's value in the film session stuff. Don't get me wrong, but getting on the court in order for these guys to work things out in practice so that they can then implement that is going to be super important. And I think Reddick's going to understand as a guy who played 16 years in the NBA that he's going to understand the ebbs and flow of a season as well or better than any other like I've never coached in the NBA person because he did this for a decade and a half himself. So I think 
that's one of his strengths, I think, that he's going to bring to the table is I, I understand what an 82 game regular season looks like. I understand what championship expectations within the context of we want to play a hundred game season and how we go about planning for that. Reddick never reached that finish line, but for the latter part of his career, both with the Clippers and then with Philly, those teams were expected to make deep playoff runs. They didn't yeah. always, but that was the expectation going into every season. And so I think that he's going to have the right mentality around what what it's supposed to be and how to build that that out. But Reddick was a worker as a player. He had to work mm -hmm. in order to make it to the level that he did and to stay relevant in the league for as long as he did. And so I hope that that ethos stays with him from his playing career and propels this group forward from a coaching standpoint of like, yeah, we're going to get out on the court and we're going to work some of this stuff out. It's a big year from that standpoint. All right. This was a fun chat. Um, check out my video on Jared Vanderbilt that I uh, released on YouTube today. We're going to talk about it on tomorrow's podcast. But until then, you've been listening to the Laker Film Room Podcast. We'll catch you guys next time. James has got it in low to McHale. McHale wants to turn his double team. Just pass out of front. Broken up by Worthy. Tip to Magic. Worthy dies on his belly. Magic scores. There's Magic. Got it. Magic fires. It's good. They win. Lakers win the game. The Lakers win the game. Rebound to Vladi. Three seconds left. That next to the winner. It's on the way. Good. Kobe Bryant. 48 points. 16 rebounds. Back with his eighth block. An NBA Finals record. A lot of Laker fans okay, sticking so around for this. You're seeing something that's very rare indeed. A Laker to get MVP chance right, in, Boston. in Boston. Of all places. Are you kidding me? Kobe. Hard to believe. Are you kidding me? Unreal. Are you kidding me? Lakers looking to push. Bryant spinning in the lane. Back for Gasol. Pretty pass. And it's back to a three-point game. Kobe Bryant picked up by Bell. There's the move. Two, let's go. Miss it. Unbelievable. It's over. And shot clock out of five. Bryant. Yeah. And that was a little tough to Albert Gentry. Add insult to injury, Kobe. I mean, what a shot. I mean, you can't defend that. Are you kidding me? 2.1 seconds remaining. Denver a foul to give. Jokic. Trying to disrupt Rondo, he puts it in. Here's Davis, 4-3 in the win. Oh, it's good! Anthony Davis has won it for the Lakers! James again. Oh, he hits another one. LeBron James putting together a closing quarter against the Nuggets. This historic 2020 NBA championship belongs to the Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers conquer the bubble, and banner number 17 will soon hang in the rafters. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash Blue Wire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash Blue Wire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed.